was actually an ask you today. He comes to us from the NIH, where he's chief of the section on growth and obesity at NACHD. Dr. Yanofsky obtained his MD and PhD degrees at the University of Pennsylvania, completed pediatric residency at CHOP, and fellowship in Pizendo at the NIH, where they have held on to him ever since, and where he <laughs> made steady contributions to our understanding of pediatric obesity. In response to the alarming rise in pediatric obesity in the last century, hitting the bandwidth back in the 80s, Dr. Yanofsky founded the NIH's section on growth and obesity where he's carried out numerous basic and clinical research studies, probing why the metabolic playing field is so uneven for some. He has authored over 300 published manuscripts, served as chair of the Obesity Society's annual scientific meeting, and was a member of the expert panel that developed the 2017 Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guidelines on Pediatric Obesity Assessment, Treatment, and Prevention, our goal. He has been recipient of many awards for these contributions, including the Obesity Society's Bar Or Award for Excellence in Pediatric Obesity Research, and the NIH Director's Ruth Kirstein Mentoring Award. He's also twice received the U.S. Public Health Service's Outstanding Service Medal for his studies on obesity. We're so fortunate to have Dr. Yanofsky with us today to share his research and his group's insight on the melanocortin-3 receptor in pediatric obesity. Melanocortin systems are well known, of course, for their regulation of skin pigment, but like everything in physiology, it goes so much further than skin deep. And we want to learn more about this third child in the family of melanocortin receptors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then it's 
prophet was asked what Jesus is that is. And uh, this is a simplified view of factors involved in energy homeostasis. We know that factors involved in the processing of sight, the smell, the taste of food, interact with black hormones and other factors that are ascending to the hypothalamus and all these together work on these central neurons, the neuropeptide lines, and the Is a positive issue because of the trade the students. It, it, uh, it probably accounts for something on the order of between 0.04 and 0.2% of all of these issues that severe early onset pediatric. So it's the most prevalent genetic factor. But in addition to that, I've talked about a less recognized gene. Uh, in the same line of the family, some of you know the line of the two receptor is the ACT receptor, causes cortisol to be released, and there's one receptor is involved in skin color. Uh, and they all bind the line of the things like alpha melanocytes to the hormone. Again, melanocytes to the hormone to a greater or less degrees, and ACT is driving that same process. Okay, so why would we be at all interested in ACT? Because of the knockout mouse. So the knockout mouse, the knockout will be this uh, has increased fat mass relative to uh, uh, the intact mouse. I'll show you a better picture of shows. Sorry for those of you who are eating. Uh, <laughs> uh, the normal mouse will sit around with white fat and we'll see the fat in the knockout. But it also has a reduced lean mass. It makes it very unique because normally to support a greater mass of fat will also be reduced. It's a very interesting uh, uh, model that we And it's not just doing the same things in the lateral portal receptor, and that's what's shown with the body study. So, lateral portal receptor knockout is not as severe as before, but it actually has an additive effect over the knockout. So, it tells you that it's doing something different and something more. That makes it interesting for us to investigate. Now, a little bit more about these mice. They show decreased intake, but only on a high fat diet. So we're going to look at that diet, but it's pretty much the same. Um, the specific interaction with their environment, later uh, uh, And um, in fact, on the high fat diet, the body weight, of course, increased in the amount of calcium weight. On that good wild types, it's really all fat mass here. As you can see here, as opposed to fat free mass, which actually is actually the Uh, and along with that, there's also this very unusual change in substrate oxidation, where there's a preferential oxidation of carbohydrates, which then predisposes to some of the So here's uh, intake in four days per day, oxidation in the balance, and you can see that the uh, oxidation of carbohydrates is greater in the uh, So that suggests that there's something pretty interesting going on here. That we to so uh, one of the post -ops hypothesized that the MC3 receptor variants might be among the genetic factors predisposing children to species. So to test that hypothesis, we uh, took advantage of the cohorts that we studied in the end of the DNA. 355 children of um, a wide variety of age, split between boys and girls, with African American, Caucasian, and other races. About half of them were overweight and had obesity, and about half were overweight. And the genotype uh, directly sequencing the entire gene and how the kids are seen with obesity and the kids are controls. And then did the uh, root blood analysis to see how the genotype of the entire cohort will be concentrated in the next. And then we associated that genotype with the phenotype that has been measured by composition of the genetics of the genotype. So, association analysis then led us to do function studies and all popular documents. First, we identified two sequence variants in the gene. Uh, both of the proximal areas of gene C63 and C63, and they need to be one exclusive. So, two uh, sequence coded variants uh, change the function of the cell. Now, the interesting about these two steps is they turn out to be in what's called linkage history delivery. So, if you have a wild type of one, you have a wild type of the other, most three, which is common. And you have the uh, rare allele for one. 
So we think this is probably what's going on, that there's an increased destruction of protein, and we still haven't quite uh, got the full story as to why this increased destruction. One thought was that this, this new license would uh, actually be a site for ubiquitous nation, but it doesn't seem to be properly located in defense. We're still unclear as to why there's this increased degradation. Okay. So, right, what does this thing do? Well, uh, it limits the growth function of the protein. Does the WMCPR variant actually enhance the intake or energy expenditure? So now we go back from the lab to our people. Um, and so, another post hoc based on Stano, both uh, energy expenditure, some risk resting energy expenditure by indirect calorimetry, so that's the hood. We measure the oxygen on the outside. And the adjusted energy expenditure is adjusted for a few factors like fat mass and free mass. Really no different. If anything, there's plenty of energy expenditure in the for the orange. And total daily energy expenditure is uh, by the double of water method. So that allows us to look at two weeks of um, spontaneous activity at home in patients. The same is true. We have a little bit smaller here because the double of water is a very expensive approach. Nevertheless, no evidence for reductions in energy expenditure. So, how about anything? Um, these are the kind of studies we do a lot of at the NIH. Studies like that. So this is uh, almost 9,900 calories. So enough that no one should run out of things to eat during the meal. And that people eat over 6,000 calories. Uh, and it's a lunch meal. So there, uh, in this case, I'm going to be showing people who uh, have a standardized breakfast uh, determined by their body size, so adjusted to their size. And we ask them to eat freely until they're, they feel safe. And so there's sandwich fixings, you know, condiments. Butter and jelly, but also items that are more uh, unit dimensional in their macronutrient content, so that you know, pure measures of carbohydrate, pure measures of fat, like mayonnaise, and protein as well. So the so mixed meal, it is a one single meal, but it also includes things that kids will eat, like MMs, chicken nuggets, and we go, and see the All right, so I've done this thing, uh, one who's also most likely a time now as a professor. Uh, that the energy intake to what you pay by the genotypes and sure enough that will be proved to be significantly more in an analysis adjusted for their body composition. So, the W uh, genotype is uh, associated with greater energy intake in a laboratory meal and also greater fat mass and less lean mass uh, in terms of body composition. And I've also shown you evidence that this combination is partially inactive in studies with the visual expression models, generates less cyclic uh, information. And really, all I've shown you so far is consistent with the neuron not out, which makes us think that this is a hypofunction model and uh, probably represents a potential contributor to life. But of course, all I've shown you is association analyses of the SNPs, by composition, that I can show you the association between water intake, increasing and the rates of obesity. So you should never believe mm -hmm. association with the top modernization. So, therefore, we, uh, two of the postdocs, worked on knocking in the human line of our three receptor into mouse models, either the human wild type of C3R or this double human C3R. So we're now calling it this H wild type of H D in the mice. And the capital of C3R is the mouse in the small C3R. Well, I'm going to be telling you about it if it didn't work. Uh, here's the evidence by PCR showing that as we go to the construct, that's supposed to have two copies of the human, double mutant, and C3R, and the same as the human, right? The mouse and C3R disappears, and the human and C3R appears, and it has a And in terms of protein, it's not a good antibody. I'll show it to you anyway. Uh, it looks like it's expressed equally as in mice without any construct. Uh, cell line that's not supposed to have the NC3R doesn't show up in there. The human brain shows up in there. So it's kind of very human brain. But you shouldn't believe that. This is a bad All right, but gratifyingly, regardless of what the antibody shows, the mice who are double mutant have markedly increased fat mass uh, compared to the wild type. So it's pretty good. And uh, if we look at their weight gain over time by 
70 or 80 degrees, they're significantly different in their body weight. But you know, we're, we're never satisfied with that because we know this is a mouse where there's a reduced reduction potential in lean mass and an increase in fat mass. So we actually did um, body composition by uh, NMR back at uh, HJP weeks. Back there, we did see increase in fat mass and reduction in fat free mass. Uh, these mice, even that we specifically. Now, if we uh, do what's called pair feeding studies, so limit the animals to the same food intake, it looks pretty similar to two groups, but as soon as we allow them to limit them, then the they be You can see the feed intake is widely increased in the double human mice. Uh, and by contrast, the energy expenditure, this is my expected measure in humans, either room temperature or what's called thermal neutrality and temperature much lighter, shows no difference in total energy expenditure. But what's more interesting, I think, to us is that the mice show this phenomenon called greater feeding efficiency. So, for the same amount of food, if you put it in, you're gaining more weight. So, 7.4, So, that's the same kind of increase in efficiency, and it suggests that there's effects on metabolism beyond the food intake result, actually. So, Second summary, the mouse models confirm that the double beam is fair. Is cause of obesity. Uh, uh, it appears to be a somewhat complex ideology for the obesity. It's somewhat increased energy intake, but there's no in evidence for decreased energy expenditures. And yet, this phenomenon called greater feeding efficiency. So, there's more data that suggests that there's a peripheral role for the MC3 or beyond its effects in regulating food intake. And it's from a paper that was published back in 2011, where Baker uh, et al. compared the global knockout adiposity to a knockout model where they uh, deactivated the MC3R only in neurons, basically, and that's increasing a uh, transcription block MC3R model. So these mice have normal MC3R expressed in the human brain, but have absent elsewhere. Now, if you use a different decree model as a global form of reactivation and looks like a lot of diagnosis. And the reactivation in all tissues is of course much more uh, heavy with the wild type. But when we reactivate all the MC3R neurons, we don't restore the phenotype. So MC3R in the periphery clearly matters. Uh, I guess you could have thought about this as we've seen redistribution of body composition and that loss of that free mass at an early age. So that might make you suspect that maybe the differentiation of the kind of stem cells can affect either the degree of the mother of the sites than to, say, osteoblasts or monocytes or chondrocytes. So does the MC3R play a role in the kind of stem cell differentiation? So we've studied that as well. Uh, we've taken bone marrow derived as kind of stem cells and then they grow in culture and eventually differentiated uh, to study their ability to. In this case, it's microscopy. Um, the red is Nile red, which is pink lipid droplets, and the blue is from the eye. And you can see that compared to even early on, uh, the double mutant uh, mice have a much greater affinity for accumulating triglyceride. Now, um, eventually, <coughs> the number of cells that accumulate triglyceride will not look that different at about age 14, but the size of the lipid droplets will be markedly increased in the double mutant mouse. So this is in vitro, away from the grain and any other circulating factors, they're all getting the same you know, environment. Yeah. Now, we did it with bone marrow derived stem cells, but these aren't from the adipose, so maybe we should do it there. And yes, we can see the same phenomenon in adipose derived stem cells. It's actually a much longer process to do this differentiation, but we can see the same thing. Here we've used another technique to stain lipid droplets, oil red o, saving. And indeed, in the whole plate, we can measure the oil red o and find it to be markedly increased. So we think that there is a greater uh, adipocyte uh, triglyceride accumulation. Okay, so if it's uh, causing uh, accumulation of triglyceride, maybe we should study the phenomena that regulate uh, that happening. So uh, we can study adipogenesis, so the process of turning the free adipocytes into the smaller adipocytes. 
and we can study the effects on lipogenesis to make larger adipocytes and lipolysis the breakdown of fat. So all of those are potential substrates um, that could be affected because the melanoporin D3 receptor is expressed in uh, adipose sites. It's also expressed as you'll see shortly in lipid. So we did a microarray to look at gene regulation in the double mutant mice. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, an annotation that we did of this microarray study where we identified 435 pro-lipogenic genes, 468 anti-lipogenic genes, and we're comparing the relative expression in the double mutant versus the wild type. And so things over in the plus side are upregulated regulated, up -regulated genes in the double mutant versus wild type, and those are downregulated. So in the pro-lipogenic genes, 60% are upregulated, and that's significantly greater than you'd expect by chance. And we look at the anti-lipogenic gene expression, 80% of those are downregulated. Again, a significantly uh, unlikely event to occur by chance. So it suggests that gene regulation favors increased storage of fat for lipogenesis. Now, the novel lipogenesis involves uh, a pathway that many of you studied in biochemistry. Uh, you, know, you can start with glucose eventually get through to citrate and then on up. I'm going to show you data just from a few of the enzymes here on the right side of the panel. Uh, acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase, ACC, fatty acid synthase, FAS, uh, and then uh, mono and diacylglycerol transferases, DGATs. Okay, so here's the relative mRNA expression for these particular lipogenesis genes. Sure enough, ACC, fatty acid synthase, and the two DGATs are increased in white adipose tissue for mice with the double mutant construct. Right. What about lipolysis? Um, we all know that we can study it by giving a catecholamine agonist, that leads to increased cyclic AMP, it leads to phosphorylation of PKA, and that then phosphorylates, uh, or an activation of PKA, and then phosphorylation of the uh, first adipocyte triglyceride lipase, which changes triglycerides to dye. The hormone sensitive lipase that mostly takes dye to mono, and then there's a mono acylglycerol lipase as well that finishes the job and turns triglycerides into free fatty acids and glycerol. So, how about the gene expression in lipolysis genes? Well, here it's not quite as clear, but at least anti, uh, sorry, pro lipolytic uh, gene expression is decreased significantly in the double mutant group, although the anti lipolytic genes are not really changed. No, no effect. So, how about what's going on here? Here I can show you the protein data. Here's uh, adipocyte triglyceride lipase, which is reduced, HSL, which is reduced, and then mono is no different in this, uh, in this analysis. So we think there's evidence for reduction in the genes, that, the proteins, that would lead to re reduced uh, lipolysis. But of course, you know, this is just protein expression. Maybe there's plenty of these proteins to uh, cause maximum lipolysis. Well, um, that turns out not to be the case. Here's a, uh, she gives a post, a uh, graduate student in my lab when he did this work, uh, Desmond Taylor Douglas. Sure enough, when we use isoproterenol stimulated glycerol release, so looking at fully triglyceride, we see a marked reduction in the amount of glycerol released in the double mutant compared to the wild type lines. So it looks like lipolysis is, in fact, clearly affected uh, at the tissue level. Now, I mentioned in passing that the melanocortin 3 receptor isn't only expressed in the uh, adipocytes and in the brain, it's also expressed in the liver. And so I'd like to show you some data about the liver and what we think the MC3R is doing there. It's a fun story. Uh, so we have clear evidence that the double mutant mice has increased hepatic lipid. You can even see the livers look a little bit more pale and the wild type certainly bigger. And if you look here at the oil red O staining, you see a lot more red than you do for the wild type. And in fact, if you measure the lipid weights, the liver weights are increased, and then the triglycerides by extraction of the whole liver is markedly increased. So, does MC3R activity regulate hepatic drop, uh, lipid droplet uh, formation or destruction? So, from a healthy liver, lipogenesis leads you to fatty liver. And sure enough, we can see increases in genes that are relevant for lipogenesis here as well. So, PPAR gamma is a sort of a precursor to multiple. Uh, metabolic functions that lead to the deposition of uh, triglyceride, and fatty acid synthase, again, is markedly increased in the, in the knockout mouse versus uh, a wild-type mouse. Um, well, what about on fat breakdown? How do you get back to normal liver? Well, you can have classical lipolysis, 
But actually, in the liver, it turns out a substantial amount of, of liver TG is degraded by the process known as autophagy. Autophagy, the cell recycling program normally activated during fasting that allows cell components to be reused. So I'm going to tell you a lot about autophagy because that's where we found a remarkable fact. So first, by um, uh, electron microscopy, we found that the double mutant uh, mice had many more non-degraded autophagosome-like structures after fasting. So here's the wild-type mouse showing nice you know, attack, uh, autophagosomes attacking the lipid droplet. That's where they should be. Whereas here you saw these aggregates, these strange-looking aggregates that did not really clearly seem to be targeting the lipid droplet. So what's going on here? There's something going on that is clearly dysregulated. So we hypothesized that it actually is important, the one important three receptor, for regulating hepatic lipid autophagy. Um, now, when you have reduced nutrient availability, so for instance starvation, uh, that activates autophagy program. It leads to hepatic lipid droplets to be sort of what are called isolation membranes. And that's induced in part by the transmission, the, the conversion of LC31 to LC32 by the, initial, by the addition of Phosphonosophenol, phosphoethanolamine, uh, that then forms this double membrane around the, uh, the lipid droplet together with this molecule called P62. P62 is on the inside, LC3 is on the outside, and that's important because you'll see that P62 is actually degraded, whereas LC3 is recycled. So it combines with the lysosome where there are acid hydrolases that can break down the lipid droplet. Forms this thing called the power lysosome. That's where the lipid droplet and P62 degradation occurs, and then uh, free fatty acids can be released, and then LC3 dissociates and gets recycled. Okay. So I know I just told you a lot of stuff. Try to remember LC3 going up when lipid autophagy is activated, and P62 should be degraded. Okay. So, right, so. Drew Young and Arnold studied if uh, MC3R activation induces autophagy. So we'll, we'll see if this will work. Uh, I've got the uh, first uh, some studies of activation of the monoclonal 3 receptor in vitro using a compound called DTRIP gamma MSH, which is a specific ligand to the monoclonal 3 receptor. So I think you can see even without the movie that the uh, number of uh, green stains, which is the GFP tag. LC3 is markedly uh, uh, increased when we get to the. Get this one, yeah. Okay, I can't. Well, anyway, you can see the other plate in the images that the amount of green signal is markedly increased when you add the specific agonist of MC3 receptor. So it suggests we've actually activated autophagy in normal cells. Okay, so um, I think this is probably would probably be the best one to show if I can only get one to show. On. Sorry about this. This mouse is extremely all right. Uh, let's draw your attention to this corner here. Oops. Oh no, it stopped. No. This is going to be problematic. Okay. Well, anyway, if I could show you the image as well, you would think I can get this one to show. Uh, I can show you an LC3 uh, associating with a, the lysosome. So the lysosome is in red. The, uh, so you can see yeah, that right over there you saw it disappears. It comes into a circle, green circle, and then you'll see it get red with it and then disappear. Okay, so that's the that's the formation in response to the line of and three receptor agonism. So beta, the gamma MSH being added to the uh, cultures does that. Um, and it's even prettier in this image, but we'll see. Okay. So uh, in vitro then we can look at the accumulation of LC3 in response to uh, this compound, gamma MSH, the specific ligand, and sure enough, in wild type cells of liver and hepatocytes, we can see an accumulation of LC3 to the active uh, form. Okay. In the knockout mouse, no effect whatsoever, no change whatsoever in response to DTRIP, gamma MSH. So, autophagy activated when you have the MC3R by an MC3R agonist, not activated in the presence of knockout. Okay. Now, the process by which a lot of activation of autophagy occurs is by activating a transcription factor called EB. So people talk about TFEB. And um, when um, TFEB is phosphorylated, it does not translocate to the nucleus and start the autophagy process. 
So there are defus correlation events that occur when casting occurred, for instance, that leads to translocation of TFET into the nucleus and then uh, activation of the autophagy program. So we asked this MC3 our mediate TFET translocation. And here we've taken advantage of a different cell line, and ht 3 t 3 cells transfected with a GFP tag TFET that's blue in color. Uh, and then we're, and so you can see the TFET because it's phosphorylated is all in the uh, not in the nucleus. Here's the nucleus, here's the cytoplasm in both groups. So now we're going to add GFP, and of course if you just add saline, you get no effect whatsoever, no accumulation of the nuclei. But in the gamma MSH treated group, you get a nice accumulation with this blue signal. Again, consistent with the translocation of TFEP uh, in response to gamma MSH stimulation. So I think we can conclude that MC3 activation induces TFEP translocation. Well, what about going back to this whole lipid uh, autophagy program? What could the one according to receptor deficiency or these double mutant polymorphisms do? Uh, and I want to remind you that you know, P62 is supposed to be degraded when LC3 uh, is accumulated, uh, right? It's recycled. Okay, so now we're going to study something called autophagy flux by inhibiting this step right here with chloroquine. We're going to inhibit lysosomal degradation. We're not going to let them degrade completely. Now, normally that leads to sort of a block in what's going on. P62 degradation continues, and the LC3 basically goes up because it's not, it's just sitting there. Okay, so if we see basal accumulation of P62 and no accumulation of LC3 after the inhibitor, it suggests a blockage of the flux of autophagy through this whole pathway. So I wouldn't tell you that if it wasn't what we saw. So sure enough, here's the wild type mouse, and you can see First, LC3 being induced, as I showed you previously, and chloroquine and starvation, they both do things together. Okay, uh, here's the, the knockout mouse. You see no change in LC3 whatsoever. I've already showed you that. Chloroquine doesn't induce it either. Now we turn to um, P62, and now we've got a, uh, what we would expect from baseline to uh, in the presence of induction of autophagy, P62 is degraded in the wild type not in the double mutant, in the knockout models. So, and then that's, uh, so what I've shown you is LC32 is not induced after inhibition, and there's increased basal P62 that does not go away. So, we think LC3R deficiency induces a blockage of autophagy flux in these cells. Okay, now uh, I've shown you so far the autophagy data in the knockout mouse model, because that's the cleanest thing to look at, but what about this double mutant model of the human obesity phenomenon? The same is true there. So here's the double mutant. It doesn't really have an induction much of uh, LC32 after uh, chloroquine, and, uh, again, or cervation. Um, and if we look at P62, yeah, it goes away in the uh, wild type, but doesn't go away in the double mutant. So again, no increase in LC3 after inhibitor, inhibitor and an increase in basal P62 ends up to you know, MC3R hypoactivity also induces the blockage of autophagy flux. All right, and well, we'll see if we can uh, get this to go, but I think you can again see this even without um, making it rotate, but I'll, I'll try that in a moment. So here's the wild type, uh, and the wild type with gamma MSH. You can see that now you've got this association of the uh, green signal and the red signal of the lysotracker that suggests that auto phagolysosomes being formed. Here's the double mutant got these accumulations of what should be autophagy uh, marked proteins at baseline and really no improvement after gamma MSH. Uh, and uh, I don't really need to see a rotate. We'll just move on. Okay, so third summary is that line according three receptor may be important for determining cell fate. I showed you right in the beginning that uh, it seems to direct stem cells towards the dipogenesis and alters the dipocyclopogenic rate. Gamma MSH, the ligand for the MC3R, regulates hepatic lipid autophagy, and MC3R deficiency and insufficiency appear to interfere with autophagy flux. So these all help explain why there's obesity in this mouse and presumably human model. So we think we really showed a novel role for the MC3R in regulating lipid autophagy. We think it you know, acts here at the initial induction of autophagy, and then it also probably the autophagy flux study suggests problems downstream. So they all affect hepatic lipid homeostasis. Okay, so I've suggested that the liver is really important, that this autophagy phenomenon is occurring. Well, how do we show that it's actually the liver 
that's due to important phase for the decrease of the mouse. So now we've got a, uh, a specific hepatic rescue mouse model. We've taken the transcriptionally blocked MC3R, used an albumin CRE, which leads to reactivation only in the liver, and then MC3R is reactivated only in the parasites. We call this model MC3R hep hep. Okay, so amazingly, just by replacing it in the liver and nowhere else, we markedly improve the body weight uh, in males and females. Uh, so that means it's not just reducing the hepatic fat, which is a tiny fraction of total body fat. It actually seems to have market effects probably through, we assume, the hepatic brain, but potentially through hepatic adipose connections uh, that might be circulating to improve total body fat. That's the blue line is the hep-hep replacement mouse. And then you can see an albumin CRE or a black 6 wild type mouse down here versus the uh, double mean mouse, the uh, knockout mouse. And the body composition shows that there's a partial replacement reduction in fat mass for this mouse in between the normal mice and the uh, double mutant, and as well as an improvement, partial improvement in the lean mass. So it doesn't fix it entirely, but it does improve it dramatically. Okay, and we're still working out uh, but we have some preliminary data not ready to show that the autophagy flux uh, blockage is reduced, is pretty much eliminated by fixing the liver. So what I've shown you so far is that hypoactivity of this gene appears to contribute to obesity in children and adults. Peripheral CNS MC3R are important for nutrient partitioning, and that hepatic MC3R plays an important role in energy homeostasis, and we believe has a novel role in influencing autophagy. So coming back to this young man, as you might have guessed from the fact that I showed you this particular young man, he in fact has the double mutant uh, phenotype, homozygous, uh, and probably has this as a contributor to this obesity. And we have some interesting ideas about how we might treat the obesity of uh, MC3R that we're going to try to study first in mice and eventually move to the clinic. So coming back to this first figure I showed you, obviously my intention is to use our emerging understanding of the biology of obesity to develop etiology-based differential diagnosis for obesity, including MC3R deficiency, and make defect-specific therapy eventually possible. So we thank the people at NIH and elsewhere who help us with these studies, and then uh, the people in my lab who do the work. Mm -hmm. This is Dr. Patel, who did the mouse uh, studies together with uh, Noah, which was not shown in this picture. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, happy to be here.